Welcome to Get Good 101, where I introduce to you the idea of Get Good, at least in the context of the coding interview. Get Good is a common term in the gaming community to tell someone to improve. And that's exactly what we aim to do here in this series, Welcome to the Coding Interview, You Suck. I'll be going over the standards for what it means to be good, what it takes to be good, and why we set the standard for what it is. Essentially, we will establish a benchmark of skill for when you know you're ready for the interview. Once we've established it, we will know how to tailor our practice and studying. And it's for this reason I'm going to start with defining the skill level before I tell you how to study. Now, this standard has to be reasonable. If our standard is just to be able to pass all the leak code easy problems in our sleep, then this is completely unrealistic. No one ever gets asked only easy questions in an interview, unless you're insanely lucky. If our standard is to ace every single hard leak code question, this is also not good. Those questions are hard for a reason, and no one really has time to go through all of them. What we're trying to do is achieve a standard that is fairly efficient and can be achieved in a reasonable amount of time with a fair amount of proper effort. I like to make this akin to Kobe's Mamba mentality, where a Mamba can strike with 99% accuracy at maximum speed and in rapid succession. You want to be the Mamba who can ace 99% of interviews. Okay, well, maybe you won't get to that point because most people don't make coding interviews a full-time job. Some of you might, and to you, I applaud your decision. But you get my point, hopefully. The purpose is to give yourself a target to aim for and a metric by which you can measure yourself against so you know if you're improving or not. So, how do you know when you're ready? Before I continue, if you could like and subscribe for me, that would really help me out. Plus, it lets me know if you like these videos and you want to see more of them. Welcome to the coding interview. You suck. So let's answer the big question. What is the skill level we want to obtain? And how do you know when you are good? There are three criteria we should meet. One, you can look at a question and think of two to three solutions where hopefully one of them is the optimal one. Two, you know what questions to ask to get to the optimal solution such that no matter how these questions are answered, you can arrive at the optimal solution for each one of these scenarios. Three, you can achieve an 80% success rate within the following time bands, 15 to 20 minutes for an easy problem, 20 to 25 minutes for a medium problem, and 25 to 30 minutes for a hard problem. Now, the first part of this standard is actually very easy to accomplish. If you do enough problems and actively look for a template by which to solve these problems with, things start to look very familiar. This is fairly easy to master and anyone with 300 hours and a LeetCode Premium subscription can get there. Everyone can master number one with little to no thought, even if they throw a thousand mindless hours into the effort. But this is also the least efficient method of actually doing well on the coding interview. Because, unless you have a photographic memory, no human can possibly memorize every single pattern and every single problem. What this looks like is that if you're given a problem where you don't match it to any particular pattern or you just can't remember the pattern at all, then you will freeze. You will frequently hear me refer to this as the potato problem. Why? Because you will have the mental capacity of a potato in that situation. You have nothing else to guide you other than patterns that you can't remember. No patterns that you currently remember are going to work, so you're going to compensate by throwing random stuff at the whiteboard and hopefully something sticks. This tells the interviewer that you are not capable of reasoning about the question. And you really aren't if you're trying random stuff. So even if you come up with the correct solution, you will still be considered a fail. Once you become a potato, you can bet your interview is dead. It's over. And as we proved in our last video, you only need to make a little more progress in your interview to double your chances of getting an offer. Imagine what failing a question does to your chances. This is where the second part of the criteria comes in. In my opinion, this is how we separate the best candidates from the mediocre ones. What this entails is knowing what you need to know, knowing what the right questions are to ask, and no matter how these questions are answered, you can arrive at an optimal solution for every possible scenario. These questions may be for your interviewer, but also for yourself to help guide your thinking. And it is through this second step that you develop your game sense and systematic thinking and approaches to the problem. You begin to recognize common situations that you find yourself in, irrespective to the problem on the board. This can be, I'm not getting the correct solution, the solution is not optimal, or some variation of that. What it boils down to is knowing what you need to know in order to progress further in the problem. Or, put more simply, how to unstick yourself when you get stuck. By actually thinking about how to unstick yourself in these situations, you begin to develop pillars and systems upon which you will rely on in order to guide your thinking. 
Not only does asking the right questions unblock yourself, they also help you get to the right answer more quickly. You know what situations to avoid, what situations are unoptimal, what actions and ideas are more or less likely to lead to the solution faster, and so on. I will share mine in the future, but for all intents and purposes, and for you to exercise your thinking, you should try to develop these on your own first. Asking the wrong questions will lead you down a rabbit hole that can burn precious minutes in an interview. A mediocre candidate can be given a problem with a relatively simple path to a solution and solve it. A strong candidate can be given an unclear problem and make it look simple. That complex and nuanced problem turns into jelly when in the hands of a very strong candidate. Now, if you want an example of what I am talking about, please look at Abrar Hussein. A Abrar, am I? I'm pronouncing that right, yeah? Uh, any anyway, I'll link his YouTube channel below and I think his performance on these mock interviews have been top notch. They have been the most consistent I've found and a very good template to follow. Just to give you an example, this guy aces two dynamic programming questions from an Apple engineer in 50 minutes and while making his thoughts very clear. He is a very good guy to watch and I highly recommend you spend some time trying to copy his performance and thinking. In every candidate who manages to achieve a strong candidate status, there is almost always a systematic way of thinking that can create the path for him simply and easily. So, what exactly does this look like in terms of hard numbers? It's one thing to abstractly describe what you need to do. It's another thing to put numbers on the board. That was a Pusha T reference, by the way, and that song is fire. This is where we get to number three. We want to be able to solve 80% of leak code problems on the first try within the following time bands. 15 to 20 minutes for an easy problem, 20 to 25 minutes for a medium problem, and 25 to 30 minutes for a hard problem. In fact, I might even err on the side of caution and aim for 20 minutes for the medium problem. As of this recording, the rumor mill seems to be that companies have been starting to give two medium problems for the interview. And this is somewhat in line for what my most recent experience has told me, where I was given a medium problem and a dynamic programming problem by a interviewer in the exact same interview. I can only assume that they are skipping the intro part and going straight to the leak code. So why do we choose an 80%? Why not 90? What about the speed at which we solve them at? The reason why I chose 80% is because this is what I have observed both in myself and the students I have coached. I don't have a hardcore mathematical basis for this, unfortunately, but to give you a sense of where this is coming from, the more mistakes you correct, the fewer mistakes you have left to correct, and the less likely you will run into these situations that will cause these mistakes. Therefore, you spend an increasing amount of time to get diminishing returns from your study. Not to mention, you might start to forget past material. So, when you get to the point where you start forgetting the things you have studied in order to try and fix your current mistakes, you're probably in a pretty good place. Now, I understand some of you are the sensory types and want a good description of that. So, as a sensory description, you know what nuggets of information to look for, how to strip down the problem, what information you need. You know what questions to ask yourself and the interviewer so that you know how to pursue the problem, no matter what the answer is. You know how to write the skeleton of the code off the top of your head without thinking in the most efficient way possible. Seems like a crazy standard, right? Well, it's really not. I would like to start covering the study patterns that I use, but I will save that for the next video. Otherwise, this video will be 25 minutes long and I'd like for each one of these videos to be laser focused on a single topic. So let's recap. You want to be able to hit three standards. One, you can think of two to three solutions just by looking at the problem where hopefully one of them is the optimal one. Two, if you can't get the optimal solution right off the bat, you at least know what questions to ask yourself and the interviewer in order to get the right answer. No matter how these questions are answered, you can come up with an optimal solution for every single scenario. Three, you can achieve an 80% success rate on the first try of a leak code attempt. By recognizing a good amount of patterns, you save yourself a lot of time and can immediately pull them out of the hat if needed. Maybe you won't be able to solve the problem with them, but at least you will have a baseline from which to start. But systematically evaluating the problem and parsing it bit by bit is not something you can do on every problem. After all, Constantly working through examples, generating those examples, parsing and reparsing the problem, and so on is extremely inefficient. At the same time, you need to have something that you can fall back on just in case there is no pattern to recognize. This is where being able to systematically parse the problem comes into play. I hope this clarifies to you what standards I believe are achievable and why. In the next video, I will be talking about the steps I use to study for the interview, so stick around. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.